Early, thanks for joining. That looks like Rachel just joined. Hi, Rachel. And Ashley. All right, we are three minutes after, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, for anyone who's just joining, again, please put your name in the chat so we know who's here and uh, tell us where you're coming from, um, either geographically or in terms of organization, um, so that we know our audience. And obviously, um, we would really love to hear questions as we're talking. So please um, type your questions into the chat box so that we can have a more interactive discussion than us just talking at you through the cameras. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. We're really excited to be at SOCAP this year. Um, our organization, Make Home Capital, has a session today and another one tomorrow that you can check out. Um, we are um, a out. We're, we are an impact investment fund um, that's exclusively dedicated to something called outcomes financing, or you may have heard the term pay for success. Um, we're a $50 million fund, which makes us the largest pooled capital dedicated specifically to this kind of financing. Um, and our anchor investors include uh, Stephen Connie Balmer, Prudential Bank, and the Cresby Foundation. So um, welcome to all of you. Again, thank you for being here, and um, thank you for being part of SOCAP. We're delighted to be here. Um, I'm joined today by two esteemed colleagues, um, Ayana Oliver-Taylor and Dave Mead. So um, I'm going to turn it over to you guys and let you introduce yourselves, please. Um, Ayana, why don't you go ahead and start? Hi, I'm Anna Oliver Taylor. Uh, I'm a, a director of development with LM Development Partners. LM is a full service affordable housing developer that's developed approximately 20,000 units, primarily in the Northeast. Um, and that is inclusive of both new construction and preservation. My role within LM is managing our preservation um, department, primarily with a focus on the company's NYCHA preservation platform. Thank you, Ayana. And our other presenter, Dave, is trying to get in. So I'm going to give him a minute um, to do that. Um, and then when he joins, he will introduce himself. Um, the joys of technology <laughs> and the multiple um, SOCAP platforms. Um, so what we're here to talk about today, in addition to taking your questions and hopefully engaging in a conversation with all of you who are here, um, is something called, as I mentioned before, outcomes financing, or often referred to as pay for success. Um, but before we get into that, I just kind of want to set the context for why we're talking about this at this time um, and why we're talking about it specifically in relation to construction jobs um, and in relation to workforce development. Um, so um, construction, as many of you know, has been among the first industries to sort of reopen as we recover across the nation from this pandemic. Um, and across the country, many different states and local governments and even the federal government have this interesting thing where they often require the developers of construction projects to hire locally or to hire people who are within a certain radius of the construction project. Um, there are other government entities that also require hiring people who are low income or hiring people who are um, underemployed or unemployed. So we have, uh, as everyone on this call knows, um, massive unemployment um, in a way we've never seen before. And yet we have construction coming back. And then we have this interesting mandate um, from our government partners um, to hire people who have either live in the communities where the construction is happening or are low income or both. And um, so it's a really exciting opportunity potentially to help people find jobs at a time of um, high unemployment. Um, and one of the things that excites us about this is that these are not just any jobs. Construction jobs are actually fairly high quality jobs. Um, they require skills, but once you're there, the wages are good and the benefits are good. Um, and they're skills that are obviously transferable to other job sites. Um, so despite the fact that there's this incredible opportunity um, to potentially have new people working on construction sites, there's also what we think of as sort of a coordination failure. So while there may be a mandate to hire folks locally or to hire folks that are low income, 
um, often developers and construction companies don't exactly know where to turn and they often go to the same folks that they've gone to before. And then you have job seekers that maybe you don't have the training they need to work on a site but are interested in it or they, are, they don't have the connections to the construction industry before that, um, that they would need to be successful. Um, and so what we're here to talk about today is sort of how we could potentially solve that coordination project uh, problem with the project that we're working on here in New York City. Um, and how we could help people who are living near construction sites um, benefit from the economic development that's happening in their communities. Um, so we really see this as sort of a, a, alongside real estate development and the sort of private capital um, and often public capital that goes into uh, real estate development. How could we also invest in the human capital? How could we also bring the economic development to the communities where these projects are happening? Um, and so I'm joined by, as I said before, Ayanna Oliver Taylor, who's from L&M, um, which is a wonderful mission-driven affordable housing developer, and also our friend Dave Mead, who I still don't see, but I'm hoping will join soon. Um, Dave is the head of a workforce development corporate um, organization that really helps groups like Ayana connect to um, job seekers and they work through community-based organizations to identify people who are looking for work who may need training and then once they're um, ready can they can match them to these construction jobs so um, I don't see Dave I'm gonna quickly um, I'm going to ask my colleagues if they can potentially reach out to Dave and help with some of this IT <laughs> while I continue to talk to you all um, so um, I'm going to start with Ayana because Dave's not here yet. <laughs> um, and just a question for you: Can you tell us? Can you tell the group a little bit about um, hiring requirements and how they work? I sort of touched on it, but would love to hear from your perspective. And given you're steeped in this field, um, a little bit more about how local re hiring requirements or um, hiring requirements typically work. Yeah, uh, no problem. So while the city encourages local hiring, the goal itself is self-identified and oftentimes part of negotiations with the community boards as part of the development review process. So the ask of the community boards is typically is focused on the aggregate number of hires and not necessarily specifically on duration, type, wages, and the like. So, um, but with the exception of like a prevailing wage job, um, all of the individuals um, staffed are like Davis Bacon in a prevailing wage job. And so LNM, we actually have implemented our own internal goal, which is based and scaled um, dependent on project size. And so there's not, there's not really sort of like a city goal for this, but I think we as a, a double bottom line developer have realized that there is a real necessity. So I mentioned the sort of double bottom line um, part of the company. And so in order to fulfill that mission, we take a multi-pronged um, approach to bridging the economic gaps and promoting equality. Uh, so one aspect of this includes making local residents direct participants in our work and the work within their communities with the ultimate objective of creating durable and sustainable employment opportunities that are supported by organizations such as building skills. And hopefully my colleague Dave will be able to join us so that he can talk about sort of how building skills helps with uh, the job creation that we provide on the, like at the outset that they can, you know, sort of translate that into more durable um, long-term employment based on sort of how they provide support on the back end. And so am I right that there are, there are federal, like, depending on the project, there are federal hiring requirements or local hiring requirements that sort of differs job by job? Right. So, um, like, with the NYCHA projects that I manage, um, there are federal requirements. Mm -hmm. um, those are Section 3, and sometimes those can also be um, Davis-Bacon. Uh, there can be a prevailing wage requirement associated with that. But um, on the city level, there is not a sort of like similar mandate um, when it comes to construction, unless it's sort of like dependent on like the financing source. But for the typical city job that we do within New York City, it's a self-identified goal and not, not a city mandated goal. And so that's why I mentioned that LNM, we've sort of acknowledged that we have a responsibility to, um, to create holistic benefit to these communities. And that's why we have our own internal goal. 
Great, thank you. Um, if folks have questions about these hiring requirements, please put them in the chat. Um, both Dave and Ayana will be able to answer them, I imagine, or at least point us in the right direction. Um, so I, while we're waiting for Dave, um, I think it would be good, let me think about how to do this. Um, let's see, did he join? It looked like Dave joined, but he's not on our moderation panel yet. Okay, well, I'm just gonna take Dave's role. I hope everyone will bear with me because I'm not gonna be nearly as eloquent in talking about his work as he is. Um, but Dave um, works for an organization called Building Skills New York. And what Building Skills does, as I was mentioning before, but I'll just repeat for folks that are just joining, is they kind of, I think of them as sort of a bow tie organization where there's um, construction companies and developers that may have a mandate or an interest in hiring people who are in the communities where they're working um, and may have an interest in hiring people that are low income and that haven't been connected to the construction industry before. And then there are community-based organizations and training programs, whether it's community colleges or private companies um, that train people in construction management and construct in construction skills, um, and there are different laborers that they train in. And so, connecting those training programs and those people to the construction companies and the developers is the sort of um, special sauce that Dave's company, um, which is called Building Skills, does. And so um, that's why we've partnered with them. Um, one of the issues that Building Skills and lots of other folks in this space. Um, face is that it's kind of difficult to work with government. Um, and so a typical contract that Dave might have to help hire people, to help make this match between the developers and the construction companies and these training companies, um, the, the grants or the contracts that a group like Dave's might get are often tied to um, cost reimbursement. And so the incentives for Dave are, and the sort of reporting that, that a nonprofit has to do um, is around the services that are delivered and the cost to deliver those services and less about the outcomes that are connected to those services. Um, and the outcomes that we all care about um, in this case and in and many others are usually connection to a job, so job placement, uh, retention in that job, whether it's three months or six months, depending on the job site or even a year. Um, and then also increases in wages is another thing that we look for um, as an outcome. Another thing that we all care about um, and probably everyone on this call cares about is people having um, training certif certification that could help them advance their career so that they continue to be employed and they continue to um, have the, um, the potential to earn um, a, a good income. So, um, as a, so just to sort of recap, there's these local hiring requirements that exist. Um, there's some funding for workforce development services, but it's often connected to outputs or services and it focuses really on cost reimbursement. So how much did it cost in terms of to, to deliver the service and less focused on the outcomes that actually come from those services. Um, and so that's sort of the, the the context that we're working in. And the solution that we've come up with is, is um, often called pay for success um, or outcomes financing. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, try and share my screen. Let me see how this goes. <laughs> Since we're not having the best of luck with technology, might as well just go for it. Um, okay, now you can see me and Ayana twice, which is not that helpful, but I'm gonna shrink this. And this spinning wheel of death, not what I needed right now. Okay. Um, everyone should nod if they can see this. That was a bad joke. Um, so this is um, a structure chart that will just explain a little bit about the um, the way that Building Skills, l &M, and the Community Outcomes Fund are planning on working together. Um, and again, if there are questions that come up about this, um, I will close this out and go look at the chat and take your questions in just a moment. Um, oops. Okay. So um, the, the way that this really begins and sort of the, the proposition for government is government could enter into a different kind of contract, um, a contract that's more aligned with the impact we want to see in communities, that's more aligned with outcomes, um, and less focused on exactly how much 
um, somebody spent and reimbursing them for those costs. So the government starts by enters into a contract with a group like Building Skills, and they say in that contract, instead of, um, you know, here's uh, X amount of dollars to deliver um, training or recruiting, and say they, instead they say for every job placement, we're going to pay you X amount, and for every um, person who keeps their job for six months, we're going to pay you X plus a certain amount and so on and so forth. So that's kind of a new kind of contract for government and a new kind of contract for most nonprofit organizations that have worked with government to deliver human services. Um, we're really excited about that because it really shifts the emphasis onto the outcomes. The challenge with that for a group like Building Skills or for any nonprofit is that there's going to be a there's going to be sort of two key problems. One is there is going to be a lag in payment because um, they may start enrolling people, recruiting them and screening them. And it may be months and months before actually anyone is placed and before there's retention, uh, job retention outcomes. And so that creates a working capital problem um, for a nonprofit organization. Another issue that comes up is uh, risk. So if Dave or other groups um, like Building Skills or other nonprofit organizations aren't able to hit the outcomes that they are contracted to hit, then they don't get paid for those outcomes. And so then they've spent the time and they've spent the resources and they've allocated staff to doing this work and it hasn't worked out as they hoped and now they're stuck sort of holding the bag. Um, and those of us in the um, investment and you know, space um, and the impact investing space sort of know that small nonprofits are not necessarily well positioned to take on that kind of risk and that kind of um, cash flow issue. So that's where the Community Outcomes Fund comes in. Um, what we do is we provide a working capital loan to a nonprofit organization um, or to a service provider um, that's providing human services of any kind. Um, in this case, they're workforce development services. And um, we make a working capital loan to that group. They then have the capital they need upfront to deliver services to, in this case, under and unemployed individuals who are looking for um, jobs at construction sites like the ones that LM has around the city here. Um, those results are then the, the sort of outcomes that are, that are achieved uh, are then validated by a third party, and then that triggers a payment from government. Um, the payment from government goes to the, the organization that received our loan, and then that money flows back to us um, as the Community Outcomes Fund and pays back our principal and our interest. Um, one of the unique things about our loan versus going to a bank um, and getting a loan is that we have a forgiveness cause that says that if an organization does sort of everything that they possibly, that they promised they would do and everything that they intended to do, um, there were no sort of bad acting and they don't hit the outcomes they achieve, um, which as you can imagine has been happening a lot um, given COVID and sort of all the things we expected would happen last this year that, that haven't happened. Um, we have a forgiveness clause, and so we forgive the portion of the loan um, that, that is still owed, and um, that makes us different than a normal bank. Um, so let me, I'm going to close out this screen and try and get back to you guys. There we are. And hopefully, uh, all right. So um, now would be a great time to type in questions. Um, if anyone has questions, I'm just going to go through the chat right now and see if anything came up. Um, OK, I see Elizabeth has a question. How would the future system handle the presence of many undocumented and non-English speakers who are interested in construction? Um, I wish Dave was here to answer that, but, um, and Ayana, maybe you could speak to this. I, I honestly, I couldn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> From what I understand, um, Dave works with community-based organizations. Um, in this case, we're in New York City, and they're across the city. And depending on the communities that they're in, they have the, um, the language skills that they need to train folks um, to be able to do construction. Um, we also have the luxury here of having job sites that are multi, multi, multilingual. Um, and so there's... Um, 
part of the matching process that that um, a group like building skills will will go through is helping to identify if they're going to be language barriers and how those might be addressed by either other folks who are already on the site and um, maybe could sort of be act as a translator or through training um, and specific training that would give someone the English language skills they need to be able to be successful in a construction job. Um, so that's the sort of non English in terms of undocumented that I'm not familiar with. Um, so I'm going to have to punt, but I would, I, my colleagues are on the line and we will um, make note of your question and get back to you um, by the end of SOCAP. We have three days, two hours and seven minutes. So you can count on us, Elizabeth. Um, all right. Celeste or Christine Fry has a question that I'm just going to read out loud. Um, California prohibits public contracting from taking into account race, ethnicity, national origin, and sex. So I'm not sure if this would be allowed here. That being said, we're voting a proposition um, this year that I think would reverse this. Have you seen philanthropy contribute to housing infrastructure financing? But I, Anna, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Otherwise, I can try and tackle that one. Um, yeah, I think that you know on the sort of private equity um, fund side. Um, foundations are definitely um, getting involved in housing development. Um, we operate a fund and uh, there are um, sort of foundation level investors um, that are part of that. And I guess I'm not sure, Shelby, who your investors are, but um, we're definitely seeing that um, where we are. Yeah, great. Yeah, I think um, you're right, Christine, that the the public contract can't take into account, um, and that that's true, at least in the markets that we're working in as well, where they can't take into account race or ethnicity when they're thinking about who they contract with. Um, in this case, they would be contracting with a group like Building Skills or any other, and we would be sort of agnostic to who that group is. But the hiring requirements that maybe come from the developer or maybe come from government often do speak to um, things like zip code or income level. And those are often not necessarily exactly the same, but they're often could be correlated with, um, with race certainly. Um, and so, you know, we have a very strong interest in addressing um, racial equity and on construction sites, you know, black and brown people are often underrepresented. Um, and so we're really excited about this possibility of, I mean, the idea of basically the requirement to hire locally um, can sort of work as a proxy if you're developing in a community of color and then you have to hire locally that's one way to address the hiring um, in this case again the hiring is happening with the construction company or the developer it's not a government um, hiring so hopefully that answered your question and if not follow up or put more in the chat and clarify um, and to your point we i guess just one other thing to mention um, you said uh, your question about philanthropy just got me thinking that we often go into projects with a co-investor. Um, we like to do 80% of a project and then have a co-investor who does the other 20%. And so that could be a private foundation, that could be a CDFI, that could be um, a mere, there's any sort of local investor, even an impact investor in the communities we're working in. Um, and that could be a way to sort of to help advance this, um, this issue. And I guess I'll just say sort of like from my side, um, when we see impact investors, it's sort of it's more so associated with the composition of our developments and not necessarily like the workforce um, requirements that are associated with it. And that's why sort of like filling that double bottom line by partnering with organizations like Make Home makes a lot of sense so that we can um, further expand upon, you know, the, the work that we're interested in doing in these communities. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. Next question I think I'll take um, so Evan asked a question about our diligence process which is a great question um, we so our diligence is really focused on the organization that we're lending to um, and so in that structure chart in this case it's building skills and so what we really rely on is um, looking at their track record. I would say that's the number one thing that we are looking at. Um, most of the organizations that we're lending to don't have a ton of experience as um, borrowing at all. Um, and so we're not looking at, at that part of what they're doing. We're really betting on their ability to deliver 
outcomes um, that are that based on the fact that they've delivered outcomes in the past. Um, so we had a project in Massachusetts where we looked at um, where they were providing English contextualized English language um, uh, services, and um, the idea was to give folks the English language that they needed to get jobs that would um, that would help them um, make a living wage. And so. Um, in that case, we really looked at this was an organization that had been around for many, many decades. And so we looked at what had they done before and what were they planning on doing now and sort of trying to think about what were the potential risks that that would happen because there were some new programs and there were some new populations and some new geographies, but sort of looking back at what they had done, what could we count on them being able to do in the future. And so that's sort of the key part of our diligence process. Um, we are not. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers the question to some extent. But Evan, if there's more follow up, feel free to jump into the chat or if other folks have questions about that. Um, we're really just to reiterate or put, put a finer point on it. We're really betting on the the organization and we're, we, we take a lot of interest in sort of who who they're um, like we look at their entire workflow process and, and we look at the staff that they have and we want to make sure that they're in a position to continue to deliver services and at the same time that they're also um, nimble enough to be able to pivot when things like a global pandemic happen and that they'll be able to be good thought partners and, um, and roll up their sleeves and, and continue to try to achieve outcomes even when circumstances are really tough. Um, all right, uh, Julie's question, only nonprofit, what, not, what metrics do you use to validate the working capital recipient? Um, I'm not sure exactly. The only nonprofit, I think um, the answer to that is no. We would, um, we would make a loan to any, um, any organization that's providing services, and sometimes we make an, a, a, a loan to another organization that sort of sits on top of many organizations that are providing services, but whether they're um, nonprofit or for profit, we're agnostic on that. Um, they have to be, uh, yeah. Um, metrics are used to validate the working capital recipient. I'm not totally sure what that means. So, Julie, if you're still there and you could clarify, I will revisit uh, that question. Um, so many questions. So many questions. Okay. Oh, thank you, Julie. I'm glad I already addressed it. <laughs> um, okay. So why outcomes financing is valuable for, um, building skills. So again, um, I'm going to speak for Dave. Um, he's probably going to be rolling his eyes, but no, I think I, I, I know him well enough that I think I, and Ayana does too, that I think we can cover for, for this for him. But um, the benefit to a nonprofit organization, um, there are several. Um, one is that, or, or sorry, just to address Julie's question, not a nonprofit organization, but um, the benefit to a service provider, that's tip, sort of the, the blanket term we use to talk about an organization that's providing workforce development services like recruiting and um, screening, training, retention support, um, barrier removal, which is helping folks that have issues getting to sort of keeping their jobs or getting to jobs like childcare, transportation, helping remove barriers. They call that barrier removal work typically in this field. Um, and so the those organizations are often only focused on outcomes and they often get money from um, lots of different sources, um, individuals, um, you know, foundations, government and everything in and corporations. And they're often reporting to a lot of those folks on the outcomes that they're achieving. They're in this work because they want people to get jobs. Um, and so when we talk about outcomes financing and an outcomes based contract, it's basically a contract that reflects the work that they're already doing and reflects the, the mission of their organization and what sort of gets them doing the great work that they do. Um, it's different from their other contracts where they're often having to sort of like keep track of receipts and submit invoices around that just show how much they spent to deliver the services. And so working in this way sort of matches the mission of the organization with the reporting that they have to do to their funder um, and reporting they have to do to government. And it gives them um, 
another, so that is, I would say one thing is sort of aligning the funding and the, um, the reporting with what they're actually doing. Um, another thing that it does, as I mentioned before, is um, it, it, it addresses a working capital issue. So um, often, was often government pays late. <laughs> um, I'll just say that seems to be happening. Um, when we, we've talked to workforce development organizations across the country, and this is just a consistent theme. Um, I spent 10 years working in government, so um, lots of reasons why I think that might be happening, but government often pays late. Um, I know from talking to Dave that government sometimes pays so late that, that folks actually have to take out loans to cover the cost of delivering services while they're waiting for government payments to come in, even if those payments are just tied to cost reimbursement and not even tied to outcomes. So working with us, we give them the capital they need as they need it. So if they need to hire someone in two weeks, if they need to ramp up services at the beginning of a new contract, um, we basically distribute our capital in a way that matches their operational needs. And we talk to them about, okay, what's your three-year budget? What are you going to need when? And when do you need our capital? And we make sure that they have that capital at the right time so they aren't in a situation where they're having cash flow issues. So that's another big advantage of working in this way. Um, and then the other one um, that I mentioned before is really the risk. So if something happens and they're not able to reach the outcomes or it looks like outcomes won't be achieved, we're at the table with them and we roll up our sleeves and we pull in everyone we know and we try to address whatever's going on to make sure that we're hitting these important outcomes for communities um, and, especially, and our focus is on low-income communities. So um, tons of need and we all want to make sure that those needs are addressed and so we roll up our sleeves and help them and if for whatever reason we can't hit the outcomes that we expected to and government isn't going to pay them back um, we take a, a loss there and so as private investors we're better positioned to take a loss than a small nonprofit organization that just does not have a balance sheet so I would say those are some of the reasons why uh, a group would want to work with us instead of um, sort of going it on their own um, I have a few other notes here. Let me see. Sorry. I don't know if there's a question. There's a question for you. Yes. Uh, there's several for you. Oh. Sounds like Ellen. <laughs> um, take whichever one you want. Um, I see the one from Ariella. Um, sure. So. I guess reading it aloud, um, it sounds like LNM is a special kind of developer. How does outcomes financing help you make the case to NYC or NY State to pay for human services? Would they pay for workforce development for public housing residents without outcomes financing? Uh, are they more likely to do it with it? I, I honestly can't say. I think that. Um, we are we take the approach of um, wanting to sort of introduce the concept first um, in terms of being able to figure out innovative ways to address uh, the issues that are sort of like at play. And as Shelby mentioned, one of the issues is the the funding for um, these jobs and for the support um, and infrastructure that exists to uh, support these individuals who are like. Um, underemployed. And so I think that um, I would, I guess I would say that I think, yes, they'd be interested in this because it's also a way to expand beyond sort of a, a low touch, um, like hiring goal and expand that and provide training beyond sort of what a project can support on its own. And this is, I think this is what's important to New York City and uh, the state government as well is creating real opportunities that, you know, are not necessarily discrete to, you know, a one-off job, but providing a scale of opportunities across, um, across like you know, sort of like several um, like parameters in terms of like duration and wage. Um, and so I think that outcome planning in this model allows us to be able to achieve that and, you know, sort of like coalesce all of the, the various issues that exist, like from an implementation standpoint, from both our side as developers and also the city's side from wanting to, you know, achieve goals that ne they don't necessarily have the independent financing for. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I see another question from Ben. Um, 
wait, actually, there was one I was going to scroll up to. Jeff, I didn't want to miss yours. It was 13 minutes ago. I hope you're still here. Um, so, Jeff, you asked if there is um, infrastructure that can provide retention outcome signals that community funders and others can tap into so we're not reinventing the analysis and reporting wheel for every initiative. Um, yes, we do not want to reinvent that wheel. Um, I would just say... Um, a couple of things about that is we try to keep it very simple. We usually are um, talking about three to five outcomes on a project like this. Um, so I mentioned the project in Massachusetts. It was job retention, job placement, job retention, um, an education credential, and an increase in wages. The project that we're working on with Diana and Dave um, here in New York City um, is also the same outcomes. Um, so it's not a massive reporting ish, um, agenda and there's not a ton of data that needs to be captured um, for the sake of the outcome payments. Um, of course, in terms of performance management, um, there's a ton that's being that has to be managed. Um, everything from the very beginning of sort of how many people are you doing outreach to, to intake, to enrollment, to screening, um, and all of and, and then all of the things in between that. Um, but we really try to keep the reporting as simple as possible. I think a lot of organizations are, um, you know, often have a, pers a person whose full-time job is reporting out on metrics um, and different funders will count things in different ways. And we try to keep it very simple so that we're not spending any, any unnecessary resources on measuring and we're really spending our resources on um, delivering the, the best quality services to the community. So. Um, I hope that answered your question. Again, if not, feel free to type more um, into the chat. Okay, I got a yes from Jeff. Thank you. Hopefully that's an uh, agreement. Um, now I'm looking at Ben's question, which I'm not t totally sure. Ben, if you're still there and can clarify. Um, integrating the delivery of multiple services for workforce development. Um, so in terms of multiple services for workforce development, I think um, workforce development is a sort of broad field. Um, and in some, as I was mentioning before, in some cases it is training someone and that could be sort of the extent of what an organization does. And in other cases, it's really addressing um, some of the social and family issues that someone might be facing before they can even think about going into training, before they can even think about doing, um, you know, getting onto a job. And so um, we really, we work with different organizations that are working on different things, and then we want to think about the outcomes that they're actually connected to. So um, I do think the world of workforce has gotten um, a lot smarter over the last decade and sort of realized that like one trend that we're seeing is this focus on retention. Um, and so workforce organizations, it used to be all about placement. Um, and um, in some cases, payment was tied to placement. Um, in other cases, as I mentioned before, it was just about cost. But either way, there was a focus on placement and it kind of ended there. Um, we're seeing across the country a focus on six-month retention. And in some cases, a focus on even further out than six months. And I think um, we're seeing also resource allocation that way. So people hiring up what they call re retention specialists or something along those lines, where they're continuing to stay part of sort of the the, the new employees support team um, and helping them as things come up because often folks, as we all know, like coming out of poverty or just kind of on that threshold, like one flat tire or um, a child getting sick or, um, you know, something happening to a lease in their house, like all of those things could really throw things into disarray and affect their ability to keep going to work. Um, and so we're seeing a real interest and focus on retention services um, and a ton of value coming from that from that effort. Um, another thing we're seeing is a focus in the workforce development space on replacement. And so sort of what does your career path look like after six months or after 12 months and sort of where are you going from here? And so I think that's something really exciting about um, the workforce development space. I'm not sure if that totally answers your question, but in terms of the breadth of workforce development services, that, those are some of the things we're seeing and excited about. Um, oh, you just clarified. I have heard coordination between agencies need online tools to coordinate. Um, I'm not sure what agencies. Um, then 
services. Okay, I'm also, I'm gonna come back to you, Ben, in a second, because I see a couple new questions from folks that we haven't talked to. Um, have you looked at things like social success incentive notes or outcomes-based pricing or in-cap back bonds instead of a simple two-party outcomes-based contract? Um, <laughs> sounds like maybe not, so feel free to ignore. Um, um, we, I'm not sure if we looked at those, I'm not sure about all those terms exactly, but I will say that we're, our sort of, one of the things that we try to do is keep things as simple as possible. And so we really feel like this financing mechanism is the most simple and um, most efficient. And by, when I say efficient, I mean in terms of our capital. So um, we have a very, we have like a boilerplate language, um, boilerplate loan terms um, and templates that we rely on. And we think that all of the time and energy that we're saving um, on getting this, helps us get the money out quickly and helps us sort of reserve our capital for the work instead of um, thinking about different kinds of structures that may be more complicated. So um, I'm not sure if that totally gets at your question, but I would say our whole sort of goal is to try and keep things as simple as possible. Um, one of the reasons we even got into this space is because social impact bonds were getting quite complicated from those, for those of you who have sort of been following this field for a while. Um, there were often um, lots of folks at the table for many, many years, and what we're trying to do is um, get more projects launched to get more services out into communities more quickly. Um, and so our whole thing is how can we make this more simple and how can we use our capital more eff efficiently and effectively? Um, all right. Ayana, do you have advice? for other affordable housing developers? Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, implicit to the work that we do is um, an understanding that it's, you know, we have the responsibility of creating holistic benefit to the residents of the communities that we're developing in. And so, you know, I think a lot of times like we as developers are worried about the cost implications of some of the requirements that we receive from you know external um, parties, be that government um, or and the like. And so I think that the private markets um, to effectuate the sort of holistic approach that we're looking for um, in terms of uh, workforce development, I think is important. And I guess to uh, Ariella's um, question um, around like, is it scalable um, around the country? I think. Yes, and I think we sort of have a responsibility to figure out a way to make employment accessible, not just you know within New York City, but um, as we approach sort of one of the worst economic um, crises of our time, figuring out a way to leverage the capital that exists to um, benefit the peoples who are most at the bottom. Thank you, Ayana. Um, I see uh, another question from Evan about if we find this approach simpler than a social impact bond um, or if we need a third party. So just a couple of things I wanna clarify. Um, we are um, not a consulting firm. Um, so we are actually paid management fees by our investors. Um, and so all of the work that we do to develop these projects um, and in terms of developing everything from like what are the right outcome metrics to the due diligence that we, we were asked about earlier, um, at, which often before COVID involved going and visiting places and really getting into the weeds of what they do. Um, all of that work, developing loan documents and, 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 um, and building the financial models, that's all part of what we do as part of our service as an investor. Um, we're not paid a consulting fee for any of that work. Um, and so that often makes it also faster and simpler because uh, an organization or a government doesn't have to go out and procure our services and then think about how to um, procure an investor later on or find an investor later on. Um, and so um, we do not charge a consulting fee. Um, I saw another question about social finance and third sector. So the, they're what we call intermediaries in this space. And so often we work with them if they have done sort of that work of helping to find a project, find the government partners and brought them along, identified the right outcomes. Um, we can come in as the investor in those projects. And we, and we often do. We have a great relationship with both of those organizations. But our role is a little bit different. Um, they tend to serve as a sort of intermediary and the project builder. And we are often a builder and an investor. So 
Um, hope that that clarifies things. Um, I know we're running up on time and I wanted this to be 45 minutes and we're two minutes over. So I'm going to um, attempt to wrap up. Um, Ayana, let me ask you one more question, put you on the spot. Um, I guess thinking about sort of COVID, uh, racial equity, um, you know, fires in California, like all the things that are happening <laughs> in the world. Um, what uh, does this approach feel like? more important than it did when we started this is I'm a loaded question than we started when we started talking about this like a year ago or does it feel like too complicated and um yeah I'll just leave with that sort of given the state of how the world has changed do you think this is, is helpful oh you're on mute Ayana like that um, I would say yes, I, I do think that um, this work is useful and I think what's interesting about this time and is that we're in a moment of heightened awareness and, and increased conversations about the lack of equality and need for um, racial and social justice. And because as I mentioned, I think this understanding is implicit to our work. I don't know that there's necessarily sort of like an evolution to like our thinking about the necessity of a collaboration here. I think it's more of um, a realization that like we've, we've shined a light on the fact that the current efforts aren't enough to combat systemic issues that communities of colors um, have endured for generations. And so this, a collaboration like of this kind, I think reinforces the need for double bottom line solutions to address these issues of equality. And so I think um, I'm, you know, I'm more excited than I was because I think that this, and as we've um, discussed, Shelby, this is an opportunity for us to go beyond sort of the initial idea of this collaboration and expand it to um, to provide sort of like a deeper or um, a, a larger aggregate need. Thank you, Ayana. Thank you all so much for participating and for listening. Um, if anyone has follow-up questions, we are available. Um, I'm sorry Dave couldn't join us, um, but he does exist and he is available if anyone has questions about the great work that his organization does, um, helping people find and keep great jobs. Um, as I said, we're the Community Outcomes Fund. We are available and around. We have a session tomorrow afternoon as well where our founder, um, Andy Phillips, will be joined um, with uh, one of our investors and um, should also be a great session. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, hopefully there'll be less technical issues tomorrow. Um, and um, just wanna say that uh, we appreciate all of you being here and look forward to continuing the conversation somehow. Thank you all so much.